In this next set of videos, this next list here, we are going to go a little bit deeper into data modeling. So data modeling is the broad theme that we're up to here. Uh, but at the same time, we're also thinking about uh, how uh, different data types result in different understandings of our problems. So we'll do a little raster vector comparison, talk about how our data comes to be, how we uh, represent the planets, uh, especially in the case of remote sensing data, which we touched on a bit in the previous set of videos. Uh, some other pieces in here. Uh, part of that how data happens process is political, so we'll talk about that as well. You're looking at an animation of greenness. As you might imagine, greenness is seasonal on this planet of ours. So when especially the Northern Hemisphere, a lot more land in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere, so the pattern is more obvious. You can see winter into summer, back to winter. This is one year worth of greenness changes. Uh, so that December to January jump isn't, you know, it's rewinding to the, the previous year, but we can't even see the dates on here, so it doesn't really matter. We can see wet and dry seasons around the equator and in the tropical areas because it's not as much winter and summer seasonality there as it is wet and dry. And you can see some places like Greenland and Antarctica. Well, they don't get much of a greening at all. A little bit of greening on that west coast of Greenland, though, if you can spy it right at the moment in the summer. Data like this emerges from our grand satellite records. Later on, we'll talk about how those some of those satellite programs came to be, or one of those satellite programs. And we'll also discuss what kind of information from those satellites we're using to create this data model. But it's certainly something that is fairly incredible and, and frankly kind of awe-inspiring that we have these decadal records of the planet living and breathing over time. So it's a really fun thing to think about. Uh, raster calculator, raster versus vector, data models, Booleans, some remote sensing data coming up. We're gonna start by comparing capabilities. So in introduction to GIS, we work with vector and raster data, both of them. We start with vector because, at least in my mind, vector data is easier to understand, easier to work with, has less troubles when it comes to just kind of random GIS quirks, looks the realist, a vector shape file looks like a map you've seen, whereas raster data, again, is Minecraft. Two-dimensional Minecraft. Does that make it SimCity? I don't know. Raster data is in some ways more used in environmental modeling any kind of satellite image or topographic data is likely raster data. So I think you could start either place. We start with vector, then we move into raster. So it's useful to compare things that are going on. So for example, a buffer. In our class, we do buffers in lab four. Take a vector data, a line, a point, a polygon, you can buffer whatever you want, any vector data, and say, okay, give me a distance around this input feature. That's even what the tool says. You'll note these are screenshots from the old ARC. For everyone who's familiar with ARC Pro, this is what it used to look like in the old version. And the one thing I think, well, there's a few things I think are better in the old arc, but that's not the point of this video. So I'm gonna stop that line of thought right now. One thing I really like in old arc, especially for you learners, is that the help was attached 
to the tool dialogs. The help was, you could pop it out right there. And I always used to say in classes and helping people learn, always show that help. It doesn't matter how many times you've used the tool, always show the help. And it's, I haven't figured out how to pin the help yet in Arc Pro. Maybe if you know how to do that, you can like share that in the video comments or something. In any case, tools work the same. So we're just going to look at these old screenshots. Plus, who doesn't look like the who doesn't love the look of like Windows XP, right? Cool. Anyway, in vector, we have buffers. Buffers create a polygon or a specified distance around the input feature. And you can play with the settings to dissolve it, to have certain uh finishing types, so on and so on. Vector buffer. Well, in raster, we have a distance analysis as well. It's called Euclidean distance. I like to say edist. Euclidean is one of those words that uh, is easy to misspell. But whatever you call it, Euclidean distance puts in a, a feature. You can load in a, a vector file in there, or you can load in a raster file. And then it gives you a cell-based distance from that input feature. So in this Euclidean distance example here, we can see that red is closer to our road, blue is further from our road. And it just increases on a pixel by pixel basis away. Measures distance, shows a distance, different functionalities. With a Euclidean distance, we can tell for each cell how far away each point is. That could be more useful. For a buffer, we get one shape that shows the distance around the thing. Simpler, but could also be useful. When we think about topography, there are a ton of different tools within raster data to use because our digital elevation models, DEMs, are raster data. So really, in most cases, you're working with topography as raster data anyway. You can make hill shades to create a shaded relief map. You can calculate things like slope, degree or percentage of elevation change. You can create aspects, which is slope direction. Aspect maps are the most fun to create. They're the prettiest. Here's a hill shade. Here's a DEM. If you pop them together, you get that. Pretty neat, huh? Now you might be thinking, well, okay, so what's a vector equivalent of this? Well, topographic lines would be a vector equivalent of this. Topo lines would show us and connect those lines of equal elevation. Useful, important would be used differently in different modeling applications. I'm gonna do that again, that was fun. Whee! So again, vector and raster data give us different capabilities, allow us different functions. You can't do that with vector data. But topo lines would be like easier on a map to see what the slope is, see? different functionalities. Now, in vector life, in vector mode, we have a lot of different tools that we can use to combine and organize and put together our data sets. We've talked about those previously. You can hop back to previous videos to see some of those components. In raster life, it's pretty much raster calculator. Raster calculator, excuse me, raster calculator is something that allows us to do map algebra, math with maps, or Boolean operations with maps, as this indicates that we could use ands or ors. Math with maps, Booleans with maps, combining maps, all gets to the underlying idea of what raster data is, which is cells arranged in a grid, pixels arranged in a grid, and each pixel has a value associated with it that is numerical. And as long as those numerical values are representing real numbers, 
and aren't codes for like land cover classification or something, we can do whatever math we want to here. That's pretty exciting. In this case, this raster calculator is operating kind of like a truth box. That's another great thing about raster calculator is that it will always output for you what is true given a certain operation. So you can do math or do truth. If you're, if you're a big fan of math and truth, raster calculator and map algebra are for you. In this case, we have some DEM, DEM250K that we're working with. And we want to know all of the values in DEM250K that are greater than 600. That's what our little equation in the box there says. One of the like functionally confusing things about raster calculator is where's the equal sign? The equal signs just run or okay or whatever makes it go. So in this case, we're gonna hit DM250K greater than 600 and we're gonna output a new file, a new raster file that has ones for everything that's true and zeros for everything that's false. Raster modeling. A lot of raster modeling is and or 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 evaluating expressions, stuff like that. Our original grid is unchanged, of course. In vector, we could use something like a select by attributes. We could use a select by location, something like that to select values that match a certain thing. So we could select all of our topographic lines with a value 600 greater. Output that as a new file. Pretty good. Again, different capabilities. Another thing that's really common for us in vector analysis is finding features that either intersect or overlap or only taking certain features that overlap certain other features. For example, intersect takes features which overlap other features and then outputs for us a combination of those to features attribute tables. Woo, pretty exciting. Gets rid of everything else, only gives us what's intersecting, what is overlapped, and puts all that attribute information together for us. Pretty cool. Well, in raster, we have the same idea. It's an and. If I want to know values in raster one and raster two, or if I want to know where those truth values are in raster one and raster two or raster three or, or however many rasters I have, I can just say and. Give me the values in one and two. There's the help tip for it. I love the Esri help tips for raster stuff. They're super useful. One and zero, zero, right? If our truth values are values that have numerals in this case, and our not truth values are values that have zeros, one and zero is zero. One and one is one. Just going top left across. One and one, okay, so we'll restart. Top left across, one and zero equals zero. Why? Because zero is not a true value. One is. All non-zero values are. One and one is one. Excellent. Zero and one is zero. Great. Zero and zero is zero. Great. Aren't we glad we have computers that can do this? Top down to that second row, though, because we've got a problem here. We have a blank representing, oh, look, there's even a little legend. We love a legend. Value equals no data. No data is different than zero. Zero is a measurement. Zero is a classification. Zero is a value. No data is no data. Now, there are philosophies about how you handle no data in cases like this. But a good default philosophy is that when you have no data in one of your rasters or in one of your layers or in one of the things you're combining, then you have no data in whatever output you have. If you don't have a measurement 
If you have nothing, then you can't make any logical conclusions from the combination of that data set. So in this case, no data and three is no data. Another interesting the thing that pops up is the cell right next door. One and three equals one. Now, and, the Boolean and, can't handle values. It's binary. So if we actually want to have real values out of this, if we want an output raster that had numerals, let's say that these threes and these fours and these twos really matter to our analysis. Maybe instead of just zero, one, good, bad, it's like zero is very bad and one is just bad and two is fine and three is good and four is very good. Maybe we want to know the difference between those values. Maybe we want a plus instead. We could do this and we could do math instead. That's what I'm trying to get at. So we could add these together. One plus zero is one. We can multiply them one time. Zero is zero. We can do whatever math we wanted. No data is still going to trip us up, but we can also do math here. Just don't divide by zero. Rasters don't like that as much as any other calculator do. Now, if that intersect example, a couple slides back, got you thinking, wait a second. What if I want everything? Then the union is for you. As we know, a union. We're stronger together. More than a hero, a union man. Unions bring all of the features together into one output. So we have our circle and our rectangle all hanging out, all enjoying an integration of each other's attributes. It's inspirational. Raster data, we call this or. Ra re give me raster one or raster two. This or that, one or zero, one. One or one, one, so on and so on. Again, no data, no data or three. You might think, well, there's a three there. It, it should be a value. No, there's still no data. We still don't know what we're comparing it to. We have a gap there. We have to respect the gap. No data or three, no data. You can override these in your settings if you want. This is just the default. Same idea. Ands, ors, any of the other Booleans, we'll get there. And again, math would give us a different output. So let's think about this versus some work that we've already done. This is lab four. We got a whole lab four playlist for those playing around on the internet. And in lab four, we analyzed a poor dead bird. The scenario in lab four was that we had a dead bird. The dead bird had West Nile virus. And based on the parameters that were set up, we had to spray for spray pesticides within two kilometers of where that dead bird was found. The truck that we had could only spray 50 meters from a road, and we could not spray at all two or 100 meters from a well. So that was our scenario. And you do all that work in, in vector land and vector mode, and you get a map that looks like this. Kind of fragmented, kind of gross, definitely not very effective at protecting against West Nile. West Nile is spread by mosquitoes, for those unfamiliar. So in vector, this required us to do three buffers, two clips, and an erase, essentially. Two clips, three clips, some amount of clips. You buffer the bird, you buffer the roads, you buffer the wetlands. You clip the roads inside the bubble. You clip the, the wetlands inside the bubble. You erase the wetlands from the roads. You get this map. Everyone who's done lab four is like, wow, it really was. At the time, this is 
scary. This is new and kind of overwhelming. You're doing analysis for the first time. And now it's like, oh yeah, I just explained how to do that in 12 seconds. We love GIS. Anyway, we can do this with raster too, right? We could say, okay, Euclidean distance. Make me uh, a new raster with a distance of 2,000 meters. That's two kilometers for all of the imperial uh, units out there. Imperial unit users. You know, feet and stuff. 2,000 meters at this cell size. Boom. There's my dead bird ring. Then I could just, you know, say, okay, all of these values are one. They're all yes. Everything else is no. Do the same thing with my roads. Show me all of these areas with road. Do the same thing with my wetlands. So now we're just running a bunch of Euclidean distances. What's interesting with these is that, as you saw back here, we have our cell size of 25 meters. If we change the size of that output cell, we would get different looking maps. And there's a problem in raster data we don't have to deal with in vector. When I'm team vector data, I say, you are as precise as you can create in vector data. The floor of your precision measurements is your precision here in vector data. But in raster mode, you're limited to a certain cell size. Here's where we're limiting a cell size, and we're going to get stair-steppy type looks. Changes the look, changes your data, changes your answer. Now, Instead of doing an erase or an overlay operation like we might in, in uh, vector mode, here we can say, okay, I just want everything in the bird buffer, in the road buffer, and in my little safety zone. So in this case, clever, right? We've taken everything that's within the zone, 0 to 100, and said, no, that's bad, 0, bad. Everything else that's no data, or that was no data in the original, we said, no, that's good. Because we can, we can spray anywhere that isn't 100 meters from our wetland. And we just said, OK, and hit me with all of them. Hit me with all those pictures, pixels that are within the bubble, within 50 meters of the road, and in the safe zone. Safe zone. And what do you know? You get a map that is pretty much at least identifiable similarly. If I asked you what the map on the right was and you knew what the map on the left was, you'd probably say, oh, yeah, it's the dead bird map, just in vector. Or just in raster. I mean... Different modes, different accuracies, right? We can see a couple of stray pixels that are not in vector mode, that are in raster mode. We can see details that aren't in raster mode, that are in vector mode. I think especially this gap here on the left-hand side, just go left from the star, there's a little gap in the road network that doesn't exist in the raster data. Which one of these is right? Yep. I mean, the raster one is right based on the inputs we put in there. The vector one is right based on the inputs we put in there. I say the vector one's more precise. Higher resolution accuracy. So maybe it makes sense to do this dead bird example, right? Two kilometers with vector data that exists that we have. Not the hardest two thousand kilometers, two million square kilometers. Maybe there's a scale where vector data stops becoming possible.
Now, one of the things that we did do in here is talk about some Booleans and or or and or or and 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 or. It's going to get weird. Anyway, seasonally appropriate, maybe, depending on what season it is for you when you're watching this. Uh, but we can talk about these Booleans in a little bit more detail. If we talk about trick or treat, well, that's just the combination of both of those Venn diagrams, trick or treat. That's all of them. Trick and treat is just the intersection of them both. So we only have where those two bubbles overlap. Again, our bubbles are trick, treat. Now, trick or treat, trick not or treat. is showing us the overlap where things are not and, but only or. Trick not and, oh, trick only or treat. That's why we say zor. Zor means where things aren't both. What about trick nor treat? Neither trick or treat. Everything else. What about trick nand treat? Trick not and also not or treat. Everything except that which is and, nand. What about tricks nor treat? Trick not or also not treat. Summoning all the Boolean fans into this video to rage. Could you do all of these things with raster calculator? Absolutely. Should you? I don't know. Make that choice on your own. 